Thank you, Sister Ranjan and Sister Prana, for that beautiful uh, introduction. And it is indeed wonderful to be uh, back together online, although it was even more wonderful to see so many of the Dallas family in in, in India um, on my recent visit to India. And uh, there were some very lovely heart connections with people as we walk past, you know, big hugs and recognition. Um, so extending a, a very big hello to, to everyone in Dallas. Um, and of course, a huge welcome to Sharona. It really does feel like an honour to have you as our guest speaker uh, today, Sharona. And you and I go back a long way, so we're all buddies. Uh, so this feels like a, a, a lovely afternoon uh, churning session, a conversation. It's great to have you. Thank you. And I must say, I also feel so full of thanks. This is a wonderful topic and kind of courageous because, I mean, generally speaking in the West, how do people relate to the word purity? You know, cold, frozen, stiff, old fashioned. And so it is so not what purity is if you're anywhere on a spiritual path. And so I love I love this video that we just saw. It's wonderful. It is a lovely video, um, and we've been churning this topic of purity for well over a year, as Sister Parna said, um, and somehow this topic just seemed to come through very strongly for this month's session. And I don't know about you, Sharona, but here in the UK, the, the squeeze on people is really being felt, um, primarily through the cost of living crisis. And we have had just about every sector of society um, on strike, marching in the streets, whether that be doctors, nurses, school teachers, um, just about every um, public sector worker. Um, and the mood of opposition is really palpable. And on top of that, it, it's almost like everyone I know has gone through so many years of no opposition from any direction. And now suddenly they're facing opposition. And I wonder if there's some wind blowing through at the moment that is is almost like a massive settling of, of karma or or something. But do you detect similarly this this mood of of opposition um really coming to the fore at the moment? I don't think I would have used those words, but on hearing them, I can re totally relate. I think the words I would use somewhat similar to other words you used earlier is that my experience is, is that everybody is getting a massive opportunity to face themselves and straighten themselves out and work with reality from a larger picture, a larger perspective, because our more like everyday perspectives, the ones that we grew up with, the ones that shape our consciousness unconsciously, those are proving insufficient to help us change. And I think just according to the degree of suffering, many, many people are going through, the lucky ones are beginning to understand that they need to change something inside themselves. Sometimes it could be assertiveness or, you know, more assertiveness or, or more um, courage, um, as well as, say, more tolerance or more patience or peace. But it's like, I would put it this way, we're all being given a huge opportunity to focus ourselves inwards and clean up something going on on that side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Many people might look at um, the Brahma Kumaris or individual BKs, meditators, and say, well, you're living such a simple, pure life. You're putting such good vibrations out into the world. You're nothing but peace and harmony. How can any opposition come to you? And yet the reality is that absolutely opposition does come looking for you, even if you don't go looking for opposition. <laughs> how do you how do you understand that? That, you know, even without looking for it, opposition will find you. 
I, I could see it on two levels. On a personal level, it would be because I do need to change something in me. Um, we wonder what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? And if we come anywhere as near this thought that the purpose of life is to enjoy and be happy and have healthy relationships, etc., then people finding themselves really moving in an opposite direction from this so on one level on a personal level I would say opposition is finding you because so many times we do not see our own character defects the things that really need some tweaking and it's oftentimes it's not challenges and difficulties which force us to see it so on a on a personal level I would say that's one reason it's a benevolent universe and uh, it's giving us opportunities to grow understand and grow but on a larger level more unlimited level i really do believe like many that we are in very very special times and this work of turning within and cleaning up those character defects um purifying the personality um, this is not going to serve just me or my immediate relationships. Uh, it's going to contribute to the kind of change that the whole world has to go through so that we can move past this night of humanity, this winter of humanity, and back into our spring of humanity, our day of humanity. So... It's such a benevolent universe. It is not a hostile universe. At every moment, there's opportunity being afforded anyone, everyone, to bring in a different kind of energy than what we've been working with for lifetimes, maybe. But as you say, you know, um, we are working with this energy of purity in, in our life of meditation and yoga. And that does sometimes attract opposition. It's almost like you hold an example of how things should be and people feel uncomfortable because of that and they try and take it down to a level that they're comfortable with. And if we look at the history of the organization, you know, there was huge opposition in the early days to the founding of the organization simply because of this thing of purity. So I, I wonder what it is about purity in particular that that can attract opposition. I would say it's more the journey towards purity which attracts opposition. In other words, we still don't have purity down pat, if you know the expression. We're not there yet. We're on the way there. So there could still be ego connected to it. There could be some kind of neediness to my kindness, my peacefulness. In other words, maybe I'm just trying to project and protect an image. I need people to like me. I need people to appreciate, to approve of me. I mean, I can see that that was my case. For the whole first 10 years, you wouldn't have seen anybody more pure. <laughs> but yeah. it took 10 years just to understand that purity has very, very little to do with anything external. It's, it's not in your words or in your behaviors beyond the extent to which it's in your heart, your attitude, your vision. So while we're purifying that, everybody can be aggravated by my performance of purity. But when there is real purity, um, whatever opposition there would be, because a soul, you know, someone out there would find themselves in front of something wildly different. So maybe there could be some kind of opposition just to someone being so different. But I have all I have so many examples of how that melts and that changes within such a short period of time. Oh, and liberty is genuine. Like, for example, I can share a short story, if mm. it's okay. Mm. I remember one time, Dadi Prakashmani, uh, for those who don't know her, she was um, the head of our institution after the founder um, 
passed on. And she was in the United States, actually, uh, giving a lecture. And they had created a huge public program in a park. And uh, the stage was outside and the seats were outside. So it was huge. And uh, those of us from the Brahma Kumaris were sitting relatively close to the front. And there was a gang of about five uh, young men, teenagers. And they were they they came in um, while Daddy was talking, coming from the sides at the front. And they were not wearing shirts. And um, they were very uh, aggressive and very negative energy. They were laughing. And they were out to disrupt the um, the program, it would seem. And I recall that some of our brothers kind of stood up and started moving towards the, the, the stage. These fellows were not on the stage. They were below the stage, but in the front on the sides. And um, Daddy kind of just signals like this. And so the brothers waited and Daddy continued her talk. And it took like about a minute, not even more, that they, they stopped, they quieted down, and then they moved off, and you wouldn't believe it, but about 10 or 15 minutes later, they came back with shirts and sat down. Amazing. I mean, that would suggest that the power of the purity of the individual soul can overcome the opposition, just like a sort of a, a wave of 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 pure vibrations that is stronger than anything that is is coming towards you. And there are, you know, many stories of the early days when, you know, Brahma Baba, the founder and Mama, who was one of the first um, had people coming towards them with very evil intent, even sometimes armed. And they were able to dissipate that just through through their own vibrations. Um, and and it, it feels like a really timely conversation because, you know, we're moving into such uncertain times. Who knows when any of us are going to be in a situation where we are facing opposition? Um, and I wonder about your own story personally, because you've been a kind of a leader of different spiritual communities or in charge of groups of people. And when you put yourself up in that leadership role, very often others will try and take a pop at you uh, or your style of leadership or um, create obstacles in your path. And I, I wonder how much that has been a feature of your, your life of service and what you have found to be the most effective way of dealing with that and possibly even how it has prompted you to look at your own stuff and maybe there was something there for you to look at. How has that relationship to opposition been? Well, first of all, definitely it was all about the stuff inside that I had to look at. I'm a firm believer in the law of karma and the fact that the universe is not a hostile place. It's extremely benevolent, always just looking to help us move forward towards what is an originally very divine persona. So for sure, it was all about my stuff, but it takes time. It took me time to understand that. And I would say there were two things that it took time to understand, maybe three. First, uh, that it was all about me, even though there could have been people who were just seeking power themselves, people who were just jealous, and they were just... Uh, or there were people who were justified in their opposition towards me. Um, I definitely benefited by checking myself. And like I was saying before, understanding that maybe the learning curves weren't more patience, more tolerance, but more courage, more self-respect, more assertiveness. Because, you know, purity with all its lovely qualities being paraded at the front is not passivity. 
uh, in purity, you can still take a stand, but you take a stand with dignity <clears throat> and peace, which enables you to stay wise because a, a major component of the whole equation in purity is the word influence versus uninfluenced. And here, of course, this is what we're studying. Brahma Kumari's Raja Yoga meditation is the study to end up completely uninfluenced by what's going on around. So a second thing I had to really learn, and it took me a while to learn, was how the most powerful tool I had to be able to confront the opposition, face the opposition, was positivity. Um, uh, virtues, qualities, but not just in terms of performance, but the real energy of that. Purity is a real energy, which is deep in the soul, buried under all these other things. But um, once I could start experimenting and proving to myself that coming to all opposition with a very clean heart, that it really works, then I was well on the road to really focusing on emerging those original qualities, the purity of the soul, and working with that alone. Now, the thing is, um, it might not be that the people change or the circumstance change. That might take time. And one feature of working from purity to face opposition is you need patience. <laughs> you need a lot of patience. But um, it's um, not that important what goes on outside. The thing is, is that inside I change. And what that means is I'm no longer affected. I'm no longer influenced by what they're saying to me or about me or what they're doing. And while I'm no longer influenced, I can be wise. I can make choices. I can make decisions, which actually are less and less selfish, more and more selfless with an intention to bring benefit to all, myself as well as others, with an intention just to move things forward. Mm. And I have seen, and this is really gold, that when there's this purity, this cleanliness of intention, cleanliness of attitude, cleanliness of feelings in my heart toward these other people, then you're operating more and more selflessly as if purity, another word for purity is selflessness. And it feels wonderful because it is a freedom. You feel liberated from all those other personality traits, which otherwise you have begun to recognize are pulling you down and not allowing any situation, any circumstance to move forward, let alone karmic account paid. Mm -hmm. Purity in intention, attitude, etc., pays karmic accounts. Mm -hmm. And everything moves forward. Whether or not they change, I change. And that makes all the difference. When you're in the heat of the moment, though, um, you know, and I accept what you're saying about being responsible for how you receive what's happening, that you don't take sorrow from it, that you remain emotionally free, all of those lovely things that you talked about. And yet, despite maintaining all those lovely positions, there can still be the thought, I'm right. And they're wrong. And however you want to gloss over that, I'm still going to be right and they're still going to be wrong. And, and therein lies the, the opposition. And you're not going to give up your belief that I'm right, because that's a really heartfelt belief. And yet it's creating conflict with someone who you believe isn't right because they're not seeing it the same as you. 
So how do you step into that intense furnace of looking at your own, what you think is right, and being prepared to see that maybe there is another way? That's quite an advanced step, isn't it? It is. It, it, it truly is. And here again, I would I would think of two levels of response. Personally, I mean, if we're saying that selflessness is another word for purity, then it's really selfishness and ego, which is impurity, the, the greatest energy of impurity ruling us. And basically, we don't see that. We do not see our own ego operating often until we're in pain. And on a spiritual path, you come to recognize that any kind of pain, emotional pain, is an indication that there's some ego operating. So often as not, that's your motivation. The pain, the suffering, you want to be free of it. You want to come out of that. But on another level, I would say that, because again, it is a big step, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're coming into a whole new relationship with rightness and wrongness, how you're going to feel about people who are wrong. And in another word, we're talking about being able to accept. Acceptance is a big thing when it's really from the heart. And I know that here, my spiritual studies have helped enormously because acceptance is a virtue. It's a quality, like others, like allowing, which is the opposite of that that habit of trying to control others or bossy behaviors. So as we explore the self, the spiritual self, which is made up of all these qualities originally, we get exposed to what it feels like to be easy, to go with the flow, to allow, to give a chance to the drama of life, give a chance to God, let other players play their part. We open to these things and there are experiments you're doing inside. And slowly, slowly, you begin to see that this is a way forward. It really is, even though it might take time. So this is the motivation. I think these two awarenesses. I like that a lot. And I remember you, you mentioned just now about Daddy Prakashmani, who who was the, the head of the organization after the founder died. And we had our teacher in the West, Daddy Janki. And she told us a story once that um, I don't know who told her, but she had this teaching that what was more important than being right was having unity mm. and she had a practice that she would never argue with daddy prakashmani whatever she was suggesting even if daddy herself didn't like it or agree with it she went to the higher ground which was to go for unity and put your own personal opinion if, if you can't agree put it to one side mm. and how often it will come back round to your original way of seeing things, but it came back round without creating that opposition. So so that's quite a, a nice kind of guiding principle to, to always go for unity, even if it means putting your own opinion, your own belief of what is right and wrong to one side. But you know, Philippa, there has to be borders around that too, mm -hmm. because that particular formula was what they pledged amongst themselves they were three to take charge of the running of our institution worldwide so they pledged that among themselves because each of them had a huge amount of the power of purity mm -hmm. but uh, so there was a very narrow margin for how wrong any one of their opinions could be but on our level, and at this point in the journey for many of us, you could still be in a decision-making role and be confronted by souls who really, really are proposing things which are not acceptable. So that's where I was saying, it's not passivity. You can still take a stand. You might even have to go to the police. You might even have to open up a, a lawsuit, but you do it 
with dignity. You do it with peace. You do it working from the larger picture. So, so you're saying that, you know, we need to walk this very fine line between going for unity, but at the same time, creating our own boundaries and not selling ourselves short on our own truth and, and, yeah. and who we are and, and how we see things. That's it, right. It, it, it is a it, fine line. It's a very fine line because nobody gains if I compromise my values and I compromise my principles. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing how much can be worked out if you just keep coming back to purity of intention and what's accurate. I would say it's not so much about who's right or what is the uh, the right versus the wrong thing to do, but what's the accurate thing to do? Mm -hmm. Accurate will often be guided by what will sustain the relationship, what will enable relationship, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's what keeps us legal in the country, <laughs> you know? There's another subtle practice which is when when someone is overstepping your boundaries and they are um, perhaps causing you harm, they're perhaps opposing you in ways that are being felt in your life. The internal consciousness, how do I maintain good wishes for that individual? How do I, whilst experiencing the impact of what they're doing to me, not just in my thoughts think, well, she blooming deserves what she's got coming to her because she's such a nasty so-and-so or whatever. You know, how do we keep our thoughts towards that individual really pure? That's quite hard. Yeah. Well, yeah, all of this is hard in the sense that we're really talking about a shift. This is a huge shift. It's like a crocodile learning how to be a flower, you know, <laughs> because we're used to judging and commenting and criticizing. The best of us are also used to correcting and fixing so it, it's a huge shift, but frankly speaking, um, one of my biggest motivators is 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 just to understand the the necessity of it, and and what I mean by that is that the person who's harmed the most by holding a negative um, thought towards someone or a negative feeling in my heart is me. We have to understand this. We have to prove this to ourselves. And we have to experience how, we have to confirm for ourselves how, if I start melting down that habit of judging and criticizing and commenting and correcting, and if I actually am able to cultivate within me the kind of godly qualities that are in there and, and how everything starts getting better. <laughs> so once I start proving these things to me, then I'm more and more encouraged to check myself, keep checking myself and go for whatever I can do to change. And it's not often in the moment that you can do much to change. It's afterwards you check. Honesty is a very important aspect of this. And it's my long-term practice of tuning in to my higher self, my divine personality exposing myself to that, allowing those energies to hit my own negativities together with God's energies to hit my own negativities. Slowly, slowly, I see that that more than anything is what's bringing change. Mm -hmm. It's like um, gently, deeply, daily, I have to be exposing myself to those good energies deep inside myself and coming to me from God. And this is actually what we call yoga. So maintaining the purity of that relationship. It, it can happen in life, though, that that you you say something or you perform actions which are, are just misunderstood by people. They misunderstand your intentions or your motives. And you can't explain what it is you meant to say or do. And then opposition can come not just from one person, but from a group of people. And, you know, in a way they can start ganging up on you. Mm. And that's a very painful place to be. Um, 
And the more you try and explain this yourself, the more it looks like you're trying to justify yourself. Hmm. How would you respond to that situation? The same thing. First of all, do I have faith that the universe is a benevolent, not a hostile place, always helping me to see what otherwise I'm not seeing in myself and moving myself forward? Because if I really believe that, I have good material to keep turning around this kind of thing, even this kind of thing. I'll see it as an opportunity to grow, to learn. Again, not just more tolerance or accommodation power, but maybe more assertiveness, self-confidence, self-respect, courage. This was my case. Um, I, I had to understand so much about this kind of balance. And um, at first, it's always an experiment, which starts just with silence. If, if that group emerges in front of you and does their thing, or any one of them continues doing their thing, it's just don't respond, don't say anything, listen, listen. And afterwards, you can start your processing, working from the larger, more spiritual picture, such as, okay, what is it that I'm being given a chance to practice now? And then practice it. You know, what I've seen is that that kind of attention on a daily basis, together with the ongoing practice of yoga, in which I'm really exposing myself to the energies which are kind and gentle. They're the opposite of ego, right? Slowly, slowly, your silence when they come at you is more and more filled with something soft and gentle. And like I say, maybe they don't change. But the work of positivity, the work of selflessness, the work of... Um, being an independent influence rather than sitting and being influenced by every wind that blows. This continues with the help of life and God, because these are those times in which night has to turn into day. Mm -hmm. All the evil in the world now will be giving way to what is good and divine. But who's going to do that? <laughs> it's only those who raised their hand, having understood the game, and said to God, I would like to help you create this new kind of energy in the world. And so it's a kind of like um, awareness of uh, a role that somebody has to be playing right now in, in, in the world. And why shouldn't it be me? Mm -hmm. And that also... Um, enables a huge amount of, um, um, I should say, incentive to keep up with love, even though their definition of love might be so different from yours. Um, again, patience and faith play a big part, big part, I should say. And, and also, I would just add that I have seen in my own life that with time, and, and this is a very important thing to prove to yourself, um, a, a, a clean heart, a heart that's working more and more from selflessness, independent of what are the influences, no neediness, no selfishness, like people should like me, people should approve of me, people should respect me, nothing like that. This works. Sometimes it takes time, but it works in such a beautiful way. This is my personal experience, what I was sharing before. They don't change, but I change. I get so easy. I get so independent of their stuff. I get so uninfluenced. We say in, in Brahma Kumaris Raj Yoga, a self-sovereign, it's a wonderful feeling. That you, no matter what people are saying or doing, more and more naturally, not as a performance, but naturally, you feel compassion. You feel compassion, which is separate from mercy. You're cultivating in you, like a gardener, you know, cultivating his flowers. You've been cultivating in you very elevated divine outlook, feelings, thoughts, and they just start taking over because they are the basic truth 
of our family of humanity. And mm -hmm. what I really want to say here is that you won't be, um, a pro it won't be happening in a vacuum because it is now the time for night to be changing into day. So many people around you will, will be positively influenced by the, those vibrations. It'll help them cultivate their goodness. And so those four or five or 10 or whoever might not change, but others, the change process in others gets stronger and stronger and you become a very powerful army of love <laughs> uh, uh, against what otherwise in the past you would have called opposition. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect to this, but I don't know if we have time to get into it. What time have we got? Oh, I've got so many more questions. Uh -huh. um, take, let's take your point next and then I'll put my question and then, yeah. You know, it's really a very wonderful secret to understand the um, dynamics of resonance. Resonance. You know, um, I will be affected. I will be influenced by somebody's disrespecting of me, by somebody's anger at me, only if inside me is that same energy of disrespecting others or getting angry as a, as a way of, of facing whatever goes on. I can only be affected because I'm in resonance with it as it sits in the other person. And I can only be in resonance with it if it's sitting inside me. Yeah. So absolutely. I really have to work at what's sitting inside me because when that's removed, you you come you don't see it. Everybody else talks about how can she say that to you and and see what they're doing, but you don't see it. You're, you are not in resonance with that. You There's are nothing in, in you that can be hooked by that. That's yeah. right. That's right. It's so beautiful because if if inside you, uh, these beautiful qualities are being cultivated of um, kindness, acceptance, allowance, then that's what you see in them. You, you see um, how you see places where they are kind. You see places where they are allowing. You see places where they are creative. <laughs> you start resonating with that in them. And in, in a very natural way, you don't have any negative feelings about them. They might continue to have negative feelings about you, but that's their chain. That's their cell. You are free. And this is the most beautiful thing and most important thing we have to be introducing into the the play of life at this point we we need more and more people who are free mm. i love the way you've described this and it's really landed very um firmly certainly for me and i hope for everyone um in part of this conversation um but i just want to scale it up a little bit because you did mention um that it's the same on on a global level and you know we have nations that are creating opposition amongst themselves. Um, so as the individual can't necessarily affect that national locking of horns. Mm -hmm. And we can as individuals, you know, certainly we can be sitting here thinking, well, I'm part of the community of purity, as Ranjan put it, um, and everyone else out there is part of the community of impurity. But then when you see things, for instance, the destruction of the natural environment, and you can feel, you know, I need to stand up for this. I need to be in opposition to this. This isn't right. This needs to be stopped. Um, I need to play my part in saying no. How um, how do we somehow include what we would traditionally see as the opposition and bring it into this embrace of love that you're talking about in other words we 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 see it we see the pain we we hear it we understand it and we include it so that there is no othering going on even if we see it as 
in opposition to the position that we would stand, somehow we can include that and make that part of the whole. Do you see what I'm saying? That we we don't we don't stand in opposition to anything. Mm -hmm. Ultimately. Well, all the reasons that I've stated so far, I mean, if I'm in a position of against, that means negativity, and I have to understand what that does to me, my well-being, my health, my happiness, not to mention relationships, but then also the world. So, so that's one thing. But another thing is that, you know, everyone has their part to play. I uh, remember a story that I read decades ago. It was a, a, a family that used to like to work 5,000 piece puzzles. And they had one out in their living room on a big, big table. They were working on it, maybe not 5,500 pieces. And they were getting very, very close to the end. And by the time they were like really close, they started wondering if some pieces hadn't gone missing because it just wasn't coming together. And ultimately it really looked like there were some pieces gone missing. And so it turned out that the little girl, uh, the, the youngest in the family, four years old, she had taken them and hidden them underneath the couch cushions. Why? Her mother asked her. She said, because they were black. They were dark, they were ugly, they frightened me, and all the rest of the puzzle was so beautiful. So I thought we didn't need these pieces. Oh. And actually, once they put those pieces back in, that black was the shadow of a huge, beautiful bush of flowers. So it just added depth, it made it more beautiful. But unless and until we start seeing the whole picture, it's very easy just to point to what's dark or ugly or seemingly unfitting and say, this is ugly, dark, and not fitting. But once we start working with the larger picture, we know that everyone has their part to play. And it does not matter to the part that I have to play. So even if I'm in politics by profession, let me continue being in politics. Let me bring in every issue regarding the environment. But at the same time, as I was saying before, let me not catch the fire of anger, hopelessness, fear. So like that, in the same way, I'm not involved in politics, but many of the people who come to the center are. And then you have the whole world of people who are doing such destructive things. Once again, that's their part. As you we were saying before, for all I know, it's not just the people who hurt me who are good for me, but it's all the many people hurting the world, which are allowing the whole family of humanity to stop in their tracks and take stock of what's going on and maybe change their direction. So I don't mind. I'm not really focused that much anymore about what other people are doing. I have great faith in the power of purity. And the other secret to this is that you don't need six and a half billion people to be operating from purity for this night to change into its day. It's going to be a vibrational phenomena and you only need the critical mass, which is a very small number of souls putting out, generating pure thoughts, pure feelings, pure words, pure behaviors. That will do the work. So let everybody else play their part. If my part is to be part of the critical mass, then let me just get on with it. So beautifully put, Sharona. <laughs> um, everything is part of the whole and you have to look at the bigger picture. And it's not for you to take a position or be in opposition to any of it. You're just responsible for your own part within that and maintaining uh, the integrity of of who you are and how you operate as a as and a also person. you know i would add make yourself available mm. because you know um if for example in theater i don't know if you've ever been in theater I have, yeah. but 
if you're on stage as an actor and the person that you're playing this scene with forgets the lines and either starts doing lines from scene two or starts making up their own lines, what do you do? You pull out the script and in front of everyone, start correcting them, start telling, oh, you're saying it wrong. It's not that way. See, it's this way. You don't do that. You use you play your part as best you can. You kind of say your line again and again, or you find little bridges which can help them move from where they've somehow ended up back to the script. So in the same way, those of us who've begun to understand the beauty, the health, the contribution of purity, we need to make ourselves available. Talk to people, be with people, bring it to your workplace. It's not like we're finishing and leaving work or households or friends or families. Be out there, go out there uh, and, and take the pride of your part and just be the good person you are. Fantastic. It really is beginning to feel to me like this whole subject of purity is such a multifaceted diamond. And we've turned the diamond around once and kind of got the, the low lying fruit. And now we're looking at harder to reach facets of that diamond, which really are, you know, they're rich pickings because you've had to work harder to get to them. And it feels like this whole subject of my response to opposition is one of those facets. Um, it's taking us into a much more mature uh, understanding of what purity really means mm -hmm. and um, what is going to be asked of me as we go forwards, that this is my this is my line that I don't cross. This is my this is my who I am. So, Sharoni, it's been such a delight talking to you. And I feel <laughs> like you. I've only got through the first, you know, smidgen of the questions that I wanted to, to ask you. But maybe we do it again another time and um, uh, be lovely to have you again. But I think we are at the point where it would be nice to just close, if you could, with um, a meditation for us that takes mm -hmm. us deeper into the experience of what we've been talking about. Thank you so much. Um, how much time do we have? Five minutes. Um, are we having any questions? Do we have questions? Let's have a look. Um, uh, do we have any questions? I'm. Uh, Perina has put the question. Oh, here we go. It's always nice to have questions, isn't it? If everything is part of a bigger whole, which is what we've just been saying, what specific practice has helped you maintain the purity of thought in daily life to avoid inclusiveness versus exclusivity? So, you know, in, in practical daily life, how what thought do you do you carry with you that means you don't fall into this this trap of duality of inclusive and exclusive? First of all, I'll say that creativity in this subject is very, very important. Which subject? The, the subject of keeping myself focused and not allowing myself to fall into one or another negative pattern. Creativity is very important. So I don't keep the same thought every day or the same practice. I have a handful, which I take from our readings and our, our the versions, versions that we study every day. I make sure that I go out into my day with a handful of those, and I'm just reviewing them to keep me nailed to the larger picture of it all. And that together with my ongoing practice of coming into resonance with the original divinity within me and coming into resonance with that divinity from God, that's the most important work. That's magical because I don't even know how, but I am becoming a nicer person. I'm becoming a kinder person. And this is above and beyond anything I could have accomplished through whatever workshop I would have gone through or whatever study I would have put myself through. It's the magic of, again, the word influence. But this time it's my own goodness influencing me and then the incredibly eternal goodness of God, which is influencing me. So it's a cumulative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the little phrase that is repeated in almost every um, 
morning lesson that we have is, you know, align your mind to the divine mind, to the pure being that we call God or the one, because that keeps you anchored into the bigger picture. You can't fall into the pettiness of us and them if your mind is focused on embracing the whole. So, you know, that is like a little mantra almost, isn't it? But also you come back to kindness and compassion. Compassion as a natural nature, not mercy, which would be specific to somebody and ultimately just cultivates dependency, possibly. Mm -hmm. Compassion, like God's compassion, he is helping us become independent and free again. And so that's a beautiful thing. It's not like you're falling into the pettiness of stuff, but you have something in its place. It's a beautiful thing to find yourself kind in a safe way, in a way which is not going to hurt you. Very good. Um, we've got a, a request for the slide that was uh, at the beginning of the session to be shown again. Uh, it is a beautiful slide. Um, maybe that's possible. But um, yeah, thank you for, for that answer. Wonderful. I think we could do another whole session on question and answers, but you know, people have probably got timetables that they need to keep to. So we ought to probably just bring things to a close now and let's just take a, a breath and pause and and have an experience of this kind of silence that you've been talking about it is always useful to remember that every organ of my body is being informed and empowered by me, the soul. Come into this consciousness of the spiritual subtle me sitting just above the two physical eyes, powerful, radiating like a star. And understand the beauty of the eternal divine self. Come into resonance with the divine and beautiful self. I am loveful. I am peaceful. I am. I am naturally and eternally in residence with God, the Supreme Soul. And that fills me with love and keeps me centered in peace. Om Shanti. Shanti.